Welcome to Drilling Deep. I'm your host, John Kingston, and let's get right to the most important part here. What I'm wearing right now is not what I will be wearing for this week's interview with Justin Bailey of Rose Rocket. The problem is that I interviewed Justin before I went off to the Gartner Supply Chain Symposium in Orlando this past week, and now I can't remember what I was wearing when I interviewed Justin. So full disclosure on that, we're not trying to trick anybody. At Drilling Deep, we talk about oil and diesel, and let's get right to some diesel numbers. On May 1st, something happened in futures markets that had not happened since August 2021. The ultra-low sulfur diesel market settled in a relationship known as contango. In a contango between the first month and the second month traded, the first month will be cheaper than the second one. The economic explanation for that is that in a perfect market, the, the first month should be lower than the second because you need to reflect the cost of money, the time value of money, and the cost of storage. That's why that second month is more expensive. When the market is tight, as it has been for quite some while, and inventories are squeezed, the market falls into a relationship known as backwardation. In that setup, the front month is the, is the most expensive month because the market is tight and it values that, that immediate barrel greater than the future barrel. Hey, we'll worry about the future later, right? So the curves, whether they are in contango or backwardation, reflect a complex brew of inventories and interest rates, since interest rates determine the time value of money that I mentioned. For so long, the diesel market was marked by backwardation between the first and second month, and also further out down the curve because inventories were so tight. But over the past several months, the backwardation has gotten narrower and narrower until finally Contango reemerged on May 1st, like the groundhog coming out of his hibernation. It was a significant movement at that point. But on Wednesday of this week, we were back in backwardation. And that makes great sense because the market is starting to take note of the fact that once again, we've got tight inventories of ultra-low sulfur diesel. Last spring and fall, inventories of ULSD were for several weeks at a time, less than 100 million barrels in the US. The history of ULSD inventories doesn't really go back that far because the product wasn't mandated on, a, on the nation's highways until 2010. But before that, before those two periods last year, there was only one other time in the last 10 years or so that inventories were less than 100 million barrels. And now already it's back. Inventories the past two weeks have been less and 100 million barrels, let's, let's uh, note that during those other periods when it was at that number, the retail price of diesel was solidly above $5 per gallon. The DOE EIA number released on Monday was less than $4 per gallon for the first time since Russia invaded Ukraine. There has been upward movement in the price of diesel on the futures market, with the price adding about $0.13 cents per gallon in just about a week. Of course, that can be for a variety of reasons, like the price of crude going up. But that move into backwardation in some ways is more significant because it's a sign that the market is reflecting those inventory numbers that are getting back into kind of the scary territory, scary territory if you're a consumer. It's only May, but as I mentioned last week, the nation's refiners are already calling for a good harvest season and seeing strong agricultural demand. And then we have winter right after that. And can we really count on another warm winter, which refiner, which definitely kept down the price of demand for heating, which I should say the price, kept down the demand for heating oil last year. Heating oil is a distillate like diesel. So the market for the two do, do the, the market for the two does affect each other. Here's one piece of good news. The price of natural gas in the U.S. is just over $2 per thousand cubic feet. A year ago at this time, it was between seven and eight dollars per thousand cubic feet. It was those, it was at those kind of levels that you started hearing reports that users of natural gas were turning to diesel as an energy source when they could. It was cheaper to do so. With natural gas inventories bursting at the seams, not just in the U.S. but in Europe as well, that is not likely to happen this year. Part of the problem for building diesel inventories is that the gasoline markets have been so strong that refiners are shifting as much output as they can over to gasoline. That's not good news for diesel consumers, except that these things do become self-correcting. 
if diesel drives higher because of that, that shift, because of that uh, refiner, I won't say dependence, uh, but focus on gasoline production, then diesel eventually gets more profitable to make. And then eventually, I wouldn't worry about that. The markets do tend to self-correct. But the fact is, we should not be drawing diesel inventories right now, drawing them down in the U.S., and we are. That's what the forward curve is telling us. It may seem esoteric if you're not a trader, but it's very much real world. Keep your eye on it. Time to move on here now on Drilling Deep. Justin Bailey is the co-founder at Rose Rocket a provider of a, of a cloud-based transportation management system that ties in with all sorts of providers of telematics data. He and his company are recently touting something called collaborative transportation and a term that, let's face it, that could mean lots and lots of things. Is it just a nice goal or is it a real system? So instead of wondering what the answer to that is, we've got Justin with us. So Justin Bailey, welcome to Drilling Deep. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. So why don't you give a better definition of Rose Rocket and what it does than my little Short, uh, short introduction. Sure. Uh, so Rose Rocket is a transportation management system, as you had, had mentioned. Uh, we focus on both the asset-based carrier and the freight brokerage markets. Um, we are uh, thinking a lot about collaboration uh, in the space. And I think to, to what you were speaking about, you know, a core thesis for us is, um, you know, transportation is a team sport. And so when we think about that, what does, what does that mean? And, you know, I think if I were to, just give you a uh, maybe an example of a network that we can all understand, but then maybe apply it more broadly. We would think about an LTL network. So perhaps you have an LTL carrier who is doing their own first mile, um, but perhaps they outsource the line haul to somebody else. Perhaps they outsource the final mile to somebody else, or perhaps they only outsource the fi final mile or first mile to pe other people in certain regions. If you look at you know any large LTL carrier, uh, traditionally they're going to be working with 30 to 50 other trucking companies to facilitate that. And, you know, anybody who's shipped LTL or has been around the space knows that the, one of the, you know, the core complaints um, of, of the, the, the end customer, the shipper, might be that the freight, you know, gets picked up and it goes into a black hole and pops up sometime, you know, in the, in the future. And, and that can sometimes be, you know, a, a, a disconnect between the technology in the business. But oftentimes, if you're working with a separate business um, that isn't integrated into your technology, which almost categorically it's not, then there is no way to get the visibility. So Rose Rocket thinks very critically about how do we connect those partners together where the customer experience around the freight um, is seamless. And quite frankly, they never know that it left your network and went into somebody else's. Well, so let's talk about how easy it is to do that technologically. I'm going to talk about some really basic technology things. You know, there's always been this kind of a complaint. I know I'm, I'm dating myself with this name, you know, Ralph Nader years ago, would complain that there's not enough operating systems and computers. Well, one of the reasons there's not enough operating systems is because technology would really have a lot of problems if we had seven or eight different operating systems. You know, you, you think about Adobe Acrobat when it was founded, and I'm still kind of amazed at this, you know, it was able to take all these different ways of doing, presenting things, whether it be word processing or design, and turn them into one format of PDF. There are so many TMS systems in trucking. Um, and there are so many other systems in trucking. How are you ever really going to get to the point where there's, where you're really going to max out the, the efficiencies of collaboration? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a huge problem and, and you make a lot of really good, good points there. So I think it's, it actually comes back to, for us, really some core principles around, and we say this to very, you know, to sim, just to simplify the problem, how do you get somebody to do something else? And so it's, it's, you know, we call it like, you know, we'll, you hear swip, swivel chair or sort of app fatigue and these types of things. So what we think a lot about is how do we meet our customers or our customers' vendors uh, or partners or customers' customers where they are? So I'll give you one example. There's actually many that we do, but one might be, um, you know, we learned, um, and, and again, you just keep trying and trying and trying and failing and failing and failing and you learn some things. Um, but one of the things that we did learn is that, you know, if we think about, uh, you know, a dispatcher saying, whether it be a broker or, or a carrier, they live inside their email. So is there a way to have the order arrive in the email, be acted on in the email, be, be you know, updated within the email and never having to go log on and do something else? So can we meet people where they are in their workflow? So it's not about creating a, 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 a net new solution in which they have to log into and do things. It's about trying to meet them inside their workflow, quite honestly, without them really even knowing that we're doing it. So that can come through 
things like integrations, but also where we see this having a lot of uh, uh, impact is when you are intentional about the network in which you're stitching together. So it's very difficult to take a broad set of trucking companies and brokers and throw them all into a pot and say, now connect to each other. Because there just might not be continuity in the business. It's, it's, it's very, as we all know in this industry, anybody listening to this knows, this industry is beyond, beyond fragmented. So how can you lean into the fragments and start thinking about the networks that exist out there already organically and offering technologies to facilitate the, the, the network versus what I think I see a lot of companies doing who are thinking along the same track. They're trying to create networks where none already exist. So we're, we're facilitating things that already are there and trying to build pieces of technology that enter into the workflow in, in a very non-aggressive or pervasive way. Now, are these, are these capabilities that you're looking for, would they be kind of unique to the Rose Rocket TMS? Or are you talking about wider tools that everybody can use? I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to say that because ultimately somebody's got to develop the tool. Somebody's got to get, got to get paid for their work and somebody's got to be in charge of it. So is this, are, the, are you really talking about capabilities that you hope to build in Rose Rocket or you're talking about broader capabilities that everybody would use that might be kind of just standard stuff or standard functionality uh, in all the various software systems that are out there. We, we want it to look and feel like standard functionality. So we're not teaching anybody anything new. The, the underpinning technology to effectively and, and gracefully commingle workflows is incredibly complex and very hard. So I'd say both is the answer. One is that, again, we don't want that end user to ever feel friction or as little as that is actually possible, or at least create a net benefit that exceeds you know, look, we do things for pain, you know, we either do things to achieve pain or, avo or, or sorry, avoid pain or achieve pleasure. And so if we can at least bring something that offers more pleasure, which could be less work, paid faster, whatever the, the narrative is that works from a value prop for that, that end user, um, that is what we're trying to ultimately get to from the, from the user's experience. But underpinning all of this, the technology, again, that, that allows for workflows to collaborate, that allows for you to do work without really knowing that you're doing it, um, to making... Um, you know, our core customers enthusiastic about trying to get their partners to participate. That is a, that is a large, large task. And that's what we spend a lot of our time working on. So I, I think it's both. So, so the underlying functionality that would reside in the Rose Rocket system, I, I guess. And, you know, one of the questions I was going to ask, and this has kind of always fascinated me about various transportation, management, whether it's TMS software or really any kind of supply chain software, let's face it you know, 90% plus of the functionality in these software systems is identical. Everybody's got it. So how do you differentiate yourself? Well, you differentiate, you, you, yeah, you differentiate yourself, you know, on that last five, six, 7% that your software can do that nobody else can do. That, that's what makes you different. You're not going to differentiate yourself just on price. That's just chasing your tail. So it sounds to me like you're looking at building functionality in the Rose Rocket system that would gain, would move people toward the collaboration goal, but not necessarily everybody's going to be there. Not, not necessarily all your competitors are going to make that investment. No, and I think it's, it's I think to, what's, what's interesting about what you said there is that you're right, like a, a, a TMS has to do certain core functionality in order for it to be called a TMS. It has to dispatch, it has to plan, it has to uh, you know pay people and collect and do these types of things. And, and, and you're right, it's sort of that final 10% that might, that might separate you. Um, I think for us, what's interesting is that when you when you look at any TMS, and this could be, and, you know, and we all have our own sort of point of view on the world, but as you build further towards that point of view, you actually start um, off gassing certain byproducts. So what, what, I, what do I mean when I say that? So if we are trying to create more collaboration and allow our um, our customers to have more automation, if they're if their carrier partners as a broker can load the paperwork, update where they are, do all that, that is a lot less phone calls and a lot less things to have have to happen. So what happens is you start building that functionality, you're like, oh, and this is gonna be an obvious statement, there's a lot of value in automation. Okay. Where else can we automate? What else can we do? And then you're it's it's interesting. So this whole thing around collaboration starts to create this like net new value prop around automation. So you start looking at other parts of the product that may not be completely related per se to to a network, but you're like, wow, they really like automation. What else can we do? So a bunch of order entry things. Can we reduce order entry time? Cut that in half. And then you, it's just, it's interesting. And then as you start to, you know, I say this often, but as long as you're creating, you're never competing. And so I think as long as you're in that space of continue to try to get better, hone in and create value for the customer, you're going to end up with all these branches from the initial 
what you thought was the core value and all these sub branches of value that you just have to lean into. And I think that's what we've done. So when I think about Rose Rocket, I think about us also as incredibly automated. And, and I think that we are continually pushing on, you know, look, how can we create a, a dispatch organization that is largely touchless? Are we there today? No. But from a mission perspective, we're very enthusiastic about that as a goal. So there's really two aspects to this. One is the development of the actual software, uh, the coding and the writing, and the other is uh, industry acceptance. Where are you on the first? And you got to get the first done before you get the second. I mean, we had eight engineers start today, so that brings it up to about 100 uh, in in Toronto. Um, you know, we're almost a, we're going to be a 200 person company by the end of the year. We're probably at 160 now, so we're well on our way in terms of in terms of building the product. We've been building it since 2016, but you know, I'll tell you what. For the first four years, we, you know, it took us it took us four years to get twenty five customers. We have almost a thousand now, and so it's it's you know it, it creates it's a we we built an ERP, and you know honestly, if you had asked me if I would do this again, I probably would have said no. But I had no idea what we were getting into when we started to build this. We've built a system of record to run a complex organizations, so that just takes a lot of time. So from an engineering side, we are adding to that. We're we're, we're quite far along. Um, but we've got a long way to go. There's a lot of stuff to build still. So we're, we're, we're grateful for where we are, um, but we're not really close to, close to be done. And, and sorry, what was the second part of your question? Well, the second, second part of the question was um, if, if you feel you're never done in this business, obviously. No. Okay. But if you feel you've got a product that you can go out and say, this really does increase collaboration. So yeah. it's not just you and me. It's, you know, we can, we can some of, somehow connect to so many of your other uh, inter-relate inter-company relationships. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the acceptance out there yeah. in the field of that? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of examples. Actually, I like that question. So we've got our average. We have, um, as I mentioned, we've got a thousand customers uh, who are paying customers of Rose Rocket who use our product. You know, quote to cash or, or you know thereabouts. Um, we have five thousand um, active. When we say active, we mean are in the product at least once a week and have been for at least four weeks. Uh, carriers um, engaging with their product who are not paying customers, who are using the network functionality, the free portals, the the in-app, the in-email type to transact and communicate back with our customers. So we see this network effect already playing out there. And then more on an enterprise side, we have uh, multiple contracts that we're, you know, we're, we're in various degrees of executing. Some of them are quite far along and fully in market where we have, you know, done what I've mentioned earlier. There was an existing network of, of carriers uh, living under a single roof. Um, this could be a specific industry vertical or a specific company with multiple orgs that we've we've tied together for cross collaboration within the organization. So a large carrier opens a large brokerage. Can they share capacity just between those two? That in itself is collaboration. It's a network. So then you add four or five more P&Ls to that and you can still make that work in, in the same kind of way. So, I mean, we've seen it not only in, in sort of the SMB um, you know, PLG led motion where you have, you know, carriers adopting the software who we've never talked to, uh, have no idea about it and it's being, it's being broadcast by our customer base, but then also a more intentional, uh, you know, as I said, hand stitched network that was already in existence that we're, that we're empowering and enabling. So we're seeing on both ends of the spectrum. Let's, uh, we're, we're doing this interview in the week that uh, it's during earnings week. And one of the more interesting ones was E2 Open, which is a supply chain software, you know, a, a SaaS product software as a service. And their earnings actually weren't all that bad, but what was bad was their uh, their conference call with analysts, in which they predicted some pretty bleak times. It just said it's a, a tough business to grow right now. Their growth rates were far below uh, far below what uh, what they had been, and the, the stock absolutely took a, a hammering as a result. Uh, are you finding the same kind of conditions out there? I'm going to give you a true or false statement: the pipeline of interest is really high. Getting deals done is really hard. I would say it's the inverse of that. I would say the pipeline is a little leaner than it has been in the past, but I'd say we have a lot more serious buyers at the table. So I would say that our close rate is actually, and I haven't seen this, so, so don't quote me on this. And again, we're a private company, so you'll never know. But I, I think we are largely at a higher close rate than we've ever been. And that's partially because our sales team is maturing and we're getting more efficacy around our go-to-market motion and our branding and all these things. But certainly it's, it's, it's more of a pipeline problem, I would say for us, than it is an actual... A closing, but from a revenue perspective and an actual ARR targets, um, we're well on target, and and we we see a clear path to um, hitting our hitting our goals for um, for this year. We're still growing very very uh, rapidly, and and I think it's we we just are we're lucky to be in a different point of the market than the company you just referred to, in that we still have a lot of headroom to grow into. Um, we're still you know we're we're a, a mid-sized organization, quickly becoming one anyway, but there's still a ton of 
opportunity for us as we as we you know as our product matures, uh, new markets open for us probably quicker than the market as a whole detracts. So we're moving the, the markets are opening for us quicker than they're than they're moving away, and I think that's we're starting to, we're seeing that in at least the close rates, uh, higher deals, higher ACV deals, um, and 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 higher buyer conviction when they show up. I would say. Have you seen any significant difference in the? Uh... In the pace of deals between the carrier customers and the and the uh, broker customers, always, always, it's never been it's never been any different. The brokers move fast; they're deliberate; they're they're intentional. Uh, carriers are uh, more cautious. Um, they 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 spend more money, and quite frankly, their businesses are far more complex. And so, it just it just it actually takes longer as a carrier to go through the the different permutations of the product to understand that the drivers are going to get value. The, there's just there's actually a lot more stress test in the product to know if it's right for you and a lot more change management uh, as a carrier. And, and again, this is size, you know, if you're a hundred million dollar brokerage and you're $1 million carrier, this doesn't make sense, but it's our dollar to dollar across the board. Uh, car- carriers they do operate a much more complex business and it's a, it's a more complex um, uh, purchasing and onboarding and product undertaking than, than it is for brokers. Yeah. Another, another earnings call I sat in on was for a try and finance. Of course, they're a different business than you, but they are trying to sell the, uh, the Triumph, well, they just call it the network. They don't have a formal name. And the, the network is the combination of the quick pay and the Triumph audit, which came out of the hub tech acquisition from a few years ago. And they said, you know, if you're a big customer and we, with your own TMS, let's say a custom TMS, it's like a million dollars to onboard that. What's roughly the kind of cost to bring your system on? And again, it depends on your size. You can spend anywhere from, and, and honestly, I don't, we, <laughs> Pricing moves around a bit. We're trying to find the, the perfect model, but we have customers that spend seven figures a year with us. We have customers that spend low four figures. And it's, it's so it's pretty yeah. wide. It really does depend on, and again, we started there. We started small um, to really get product iteration to understand from the customer. Like nothing will prove out your product faster than, a, than, a, than a, an SMB customer whose livelihood depends on the execution of their business day to day. And so you really get a lot of great feedback loops really, really fast. And so you start small and you kind of work your way more at market. And usually as you're doing that along the way, you'll pick up a few enterprise customers who are more early adopters and want to be in a bit earlier. So we, we, we kind of did that path. So um, we have a, a, a few large, large customers and, and you know, a thousand call it ish small, uh, small to medium sized customers. And so it's, it's really, it runs, it runs the gamut in terms of size. So it really is about right sizing for your business. There are certain size customers, certain types of customers that just aren't a good fit for Rose Rocket. Um, but we're actually working to address that and trying to fill those holes. We really do hope there's a day not far from now that if you are in the surface transportation, in North America, um, Rose Rocket's the right fit for you, you know, regardless of the size of your business. I'm going to ask a question that's like incredibly, it's so basic that it might be considered stupid. Okay. <laughs> When a company uses your TMS system, is that the only TMS system they have? Or is there any reason why you would have multiple TMS systems within a single enterprise? Yeah, actually, it happens more than you might think. And it's actually a pretty good question because you, you again, this, this is this is complexity of company. So a large enterprise, let's, let's define that by a company that says, you know, maybe a billion dollars plus in revenue just, just for a number, are going to buy Rose Rocket not to run their entire business. We are not, uh, we're not Oracle. And so you use Rose Rocket to solve a particular problem in the business or a particular line item in the business. And those businesses, in some cases, might have three, four, five, six TMS systems, maybe more, in fact, it depends how big they are. And so because they're using them for different kind of call it divisions within the business, different use cases, where a smaller customer is going to use Rose Rocket as, you know, if you're an, you're an asset-based carrier, you have your ELD, you have your accounting system, and you have your, you have your TMS. And that's your entire technology stack. So again, complexity matters here. Um, but certainly if you, if you think about what we see in a pretty common, say, again, taking out kind of that SM, that small business and taking out the, the, the enterprise and that, and that more of that mid market size, um, you, you may see a broker and a carrier is the same business. And what you'll get there is, is a single, is a TMS for brokerage and a TMS for, for asset. We certainly try to sell against that. That goes back to the collaboration narrative where we can try to create more unification across those two systems and they can share freight and be a little more efficient across the two businesses. All right, Justin, one last question, kind of ask this of everybody. I think everybody at FreightWaves asks their guests these days. And you said your pipeline is, well, you said it's a little slower. Uh, deals are getting done. You see any sign to the uh, bottom of a freight market right now? You know, we try, I mean, we track a lot of things, right? We can see the the operating, you know, we, we don't look at it at a, on an individual basis, but we certainly look at, you know, you know sort of GMV within our, within our, overall, you know, how much freight is moving through our, through our system. Um, I don't know that we have a good purview on, you know, if we can see a bottom of the market and 
I'm not an economist, so I certainly can't really comment, you know, to to intelligently on what's happening in the economy. But you know, again, what I can say is that what we are seeing is that, uh, and this is this is more um, colloquial than it is data driven. But what I think we're seeing is is certainly, you know, there are certain industries and verticals in the transportation space that are having a harder time than others. And so we are seeing certain types of customers showing up more regularly and talking to them, having business conversations with them and not seeing such a drastic reduction in their business. So LTL seems to be doing okay. Um, Flatbed seems to be doing actually pretty well. So there's these kind of like, it's, so it's not, it's not all doom and gloom category wise, but, and I think you will see this in not just trucking, but a lot of industry niche businesses do very, very well in times of turbulence and they do well in, in a lot of times too. So I think, the more broad you are as an organization, um, I think you just tend to have harder times in climates like this. So we're, we're seeing probably more niche players show up. But, you know, good thing for us, this market is just made up of, you know, hundreds of thousands of niche players. So it's I think I think the dynamic and the, and the mix of our of, of the customer base or, or prospect base in this case are, are is is a little bit different. I'd have to spend a little more time fine tooth combing that to give you a you know a, a data driven answer, but just from a, from an instinct perspective, it just it feels like there's been a, a bit of a shift in the type of customers that we're seeing that are actually making purchasing you know decisions and 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 committing to the you know to, to the to the pretty significant change that it is to you know to um, especially in a, in a in a in a lift and shift of a TMS going from a, an incumbent to a new TMS is is a is a, in a serious undertaking. So, um, but we're getting good commit there, and and again, I'd say that. It's maybe just a bit of a different mix of of of, uh, of customers. I do want to say when you just said I am not an economist, I heard that as I am not a communist. So we're glad. <laughs> I'm, I know I'm Canadian, and look, we've I've been accused of worse, but I am not I'm not a communist a communist either. But we do have free healthcare. That is true. All right. <laughs> uh, we want to thank Justin Bailey. He is the co-founder of Rose Rocket, which is a cloud-based TMS system, for joining us here today on Drilling Deep. Justin, thanks again. John, that was fun. Thanks for having me. You have been watching Drilling Deep. We are part of the Freight Cash family of podcasts from Freight Waves. You can find us on all the leading podcast platforms, including, of course, Freight Waves TV. I've been your host, John Kingston, and please join us again.